we bought the farm from a, from an estate, so we were never able to actually meet the family and get the history. Mm. But I saw that, and I'm like, what the heck's that about? So every time we would meet some that, one that knew the previous owners, we would ask them, you know, what can you tell us? What can you tell us? And one of the time, one of the nephews showed up. He said, well, tell us a story about the farm. He said, what can I tell you? He said, okay, when we were kids, we were staying at the farm, and all of a sudden, Grandma Harden came out the front door with this beat-up 22 rifle and a, and a bullet, and she was all upset. She said, there's a porcupine eating my pear tree. You go shoot it. So that was a, a, a normal pear tree. The porcupine ate the bark off of one um. side, and then the carpenter and, ants got in and ate the, the trunk out hollow. But we've been here since 2005, and I cut it off. I cut the top two-thirds of it off, and it still... Uh, grows good. This is one of the few years we haven't had much of a crop and we had exactly because of the freaking heat and the lack of rain Well, no, that's not actually it. What it was it well, it was really hot in April It was like 80 degrees the end of March. Oh, yeah, yeah And then we had a bunch of hard frost so it killed all the made the, the flower buds come out. Oh, yep So this is one of our um, the Season extension hoop houses right now the plastic is not on because we've got only hot weather crops in here we have beans growing on the, the trellis and also trellis on uh, strings on the outside. We have drip irrigation for the whole garden so that when Danny wants to water, she just looks at it to say, well, which row needs it? If the row needs it, the valve goes this way. If the row doesn't need it, she turns it the other way. Then there's a wind-up timer she can set for however long, an hour, two hours. And then the water just seeps out of these hoses into the crop and we can water even when it's hot and sunny and windy like this. And we have very little loss to evaporation. The water goes right to the plants and not on the foliage. So you're not getting, uh, causing fungal disease from wet foliage and you're not watering the aisles to encourage the weeds. And very efficient time-wise and water-wise. So who among you are gardeners? Um, eh, I try. Okay. Our, our, my dad is. <laughs> we, had a, we have a greenhouse at my school. Oh, nice. So this is sweet corn, zucchinis, and then we do a lot with these cloths we call floating grow covers. These are like uh, the Swiss Army knife of organic farming. And so this is kale, and this is doing two jobs for the kale. One, it's keeping the cabbage moths, the little white moths that lay the eggs that turn into the green worms. Oh. So it's keeping them away. The other thing is it's keeping the wind off the kale because any plant, in particular important to humans, a leafy green that you eat, if it's out in the wind and the wind buffets it, the plant has to toughen up its cell structure so that it can withstand the wind. And when it does that, it makes it chewier and more bitter. Hmm. So by being under the row cover, it's protected from the wind to a large degree, so the greens are sweeter and more tender than they would be otherwise. Here we have leeks, and the row cover here is to protect them against an invasive pest called the European leek moth. Oh no. So the leek moth likes all the allium families, leeks, onions, garlic, chives, um, and it lays its eggs, it flies at night one, about once every two weeks, and the mothers lay their eggs, and then the little worms burrow down right inside the stalk. Hmm. And so with leeks, the stalk is what you want to eat. With your onions and garlic and the other stuff, it, you don't necessarily eat that part, but it's still important to the growth. So um, this keeps the, the bugs from getting to lay their eggs. Can anybody guess what this vegetable is? A carrot. Very good. Oh man, this is so uneven. <laughs> yes, it is. Not a golf course. <laughs> so here we have beets and we have dill. I'm pretty sure the dill is mostly volunteer. We do a lot of ecoscaping where we let things that other people would consider to be weeds grow because they serve us. And the dill flowers attract little tiny parasitic wasps. And they're only about that big. You have to look really close to see them. And they don't sting humans, but the adults drink the nectar from the little flowers. And then when they go to reproduce, they look for a soft-bodied bug, like the larva of a potato beetle or a bean beetle, a cucumber beetle, and they lay their eggs inside. 
and then when the babies hatch out, they eat the bad bug from the inside out. Yeah. So it's nat sounds gross, but it's natural pest control. So what that means is we don't have to spray any toxic chemicals to control the bugs. What's going on? What's that banging? Oh. I do too. Tomatoes. Tomato. So on this main trellis is our, our main crop of tomatoes, the early girls, and they're not quite ripening yet. On here, trellised on the strings, we have the sun gold. So they're like a, a, a big cherry tomato, almost like a plum size, and they're just starting to come ripe. And then who knows what, what this kind of is going on the hill. Uh, potatoes. Yes. And these aren't just boring white Russian potatoes like you make with kind of French fries. These are mm. all different varieties of heirloom potatoes. So the ones she's picking now are a variety called red gold. They have red skins, but when you cut them open, the flesh is yellow. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, boil them and mash them, they taste like they're buttered just with the potato with no butter. Mm -hmm. And then she grows some purple varieties and all, all different kinds of really special potatoes with special textures and special flavors. All right, next top where? Brussels sprouts. Who knows what this vegetable is? Brussels sprouts. Yep, very good. I'm going to say watermelon. Watermelon sugar. Hi. Stalks. Uncle Duna would know a lot about oh, this. Red stalks. You would make a, a pie with cherry. Rhubarb. Rhubarb, yep. And how about yeah. the far end? The ferns. The really tall ferns. I have no idea on that. That is asparagus. Ew. Oh, okay. I like now, rhubarb and asparagus are both perennial crops, which means they live for multiple years. Most of the vegetables that we grow are annuals, which means we till the ground up in the spring, we plant the vegetable, it grows, we pick it and eat it, or it dies in the fall. We do it next year, and this year after year after year. Perennial crops have a multi-year plan. So the thing about asparagus and also rhubarb is the, the plant that you pick and eat this year is grown with the solar energy that the plant saved last year. Okay. So what you have to do is at a certain point you have to stop harvesting and let the plant grow up and build a new solar collector so it can put energy into the roots for next year's crop. If you just kept harvesting and harvesting and harvesting, you'd end up with no root, no uh, asparagus next year or no rhubarb either. <laughs> so. And then the last one is all of our, our winter squashes. So. There's lots of bugs that like the squashes. There's squash bugs and there's uh, uh, borers. And the bugs are a problem not only from the, what they eat of the plant, but also the diseases that they carry. They tend to carry a lot of uh, viruses. So what we do is Danny has a, a great big sheet of that row cover. And as soon as she plants her vine crops, she covers them with the row cover. And they grow and they grow and the bugs can't get to them until they start to blossom. Now, because the, these plants need the bees to pollinate them, you have to uncover them once they stop blossoming. And then as soon as you do, the bad bugs are like, oh, look, look, there's something to eat. But now the plant already has a head start. It's built some strength up, and it's able to start making its own chemical self-defense arsenal. So even if the, the squash bugs or the borers start to attack them, plant has some ability to fight back. Not that they aren't affected, mm -hmm. but they have a lot better chance of winning the battle. <laughs> All right, let's, I guess, we're going to rearrange this. Next stop is going to be the edible forest. So we're going to go back out and through the front. What's that supposed to mean? Back to where we came in. Oh, and this, this here is our wind turbine which has not been making electricity, unfortunately, for the last three years. We have, you can't see them from here, but over there we have uh, solar panels. Is that what's making that loud racket over there? That's what's making the racket. Quack, quack, quack.
What are those chipmunks? Canisius. Uh huh. South, yeah, south of Rochester. It's about four hours away from here. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do work in Corning and Elmira. Yep. Uh, well, communications work, so I would, in the days before beeper, or before cell phones, if you had to be in on call, mm -hmm. you had a beeper. Yeah. And so I took care of the radio links that, that made the beepers work. So I had a, a car full of, of tools and test equipment. I drive up on the hilltop where the tall radio towers were. And in the snowy time, sometimes you couldn't get all the way up there. So then I have to drive as far as I could and take my toboggan out and <laughs> load my test equipment on the toboggan, put my snowshoes on. And... You got dogs, huh? Yep. It's a good place to be a dog. We're getting hot out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, it's been we're not in Arizona though. I was talking to one of my friends who was going back to Arizona. He said it was 120 there. Oh. But it's dry heat. It's okay. <laughs> I'm getting some interesting footage for YouTube. Uncle Duna would be impressed. Mm -hmm. You all right, dude? I don't think he's okay. Thunder. get hit by a car, people. <laughs> I'm just joking. Why do they got pigs here? Oh, no, 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 no. So now we're walking to, I don't know where we're walking to. Let's find out. Alrighty. I can hear that machine over there. Yeah. Failing to make electricity. Say hi, Mom. We're entering the, the Enchanted Edible Forest. You pick a tourist workshop of it. That's pretty cool. Building. Okay, so we're now entering the Edible Forest, apparently. As I'm talking to my peop the people, talking to my camera, so I can post it, and you know what's going on. What's that? Is this where all the cows and such are? Has anyone here ever heard of permaculture? Yes, I've heard of it. So permaculture is short for perennial agriculture. Mm -hmm. And in the vegetable garden, we grow almost all annual plants. We talked about you know, one year life plan, you got to do it over and over and over again forever. 
until you want to stop eating. Oh no. Yeah, it's a lot of work and it's, and it's a little challenging on the environment because you have to keep tilling up the soil. So peren permaculture is about perennial agriculture. So we're growing with perennial plants that have a long-term plan. And so we're not always digging up the dirt. And what we're trying to do, let's get into the shade, guys. Here, we're trying to mimic the, the best of Mother Nature and learn from her where a forest edge meets a grassland. And when you have two ecosystems come together, you have the maximum diversity of, of species and you also have the most productivity. <sighs> There's a lot of thought and planning that goes into permaculture. And in the perfect world, when you start out to do a permaculture planting, you would spend two full years studying your land through all the seasons and trying to figure out what, what freezes first, which dries out first, which thaws, where are the high spots, the low spots, this, the north, which faces south, north, east, west, because each little tiny microclimate is better adapted to a certain kind of plant. And so you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to match the plant to its perfect location in the, the garden or the forest. And then we're trying to make maximum use of vertical space, just like in a forest, so we have Sorry. seven layers. So we have the overstory layers, which are the really tall trees like the black locust, or they could be uh, hickory trees, or they could be walnut trees. We have the understory layers, which could be your fruit trees, your apples, your pears, your plums. We have the shrub layer, which could be like your roses, could be your elderberries, could be raspberries. You have the vegetative layer, which is perennial plants, that, but they are soft plants that die back down to the ground every year in the winter and then grow back in the spring. You have ground covers like this. There's some wild strawberries in here. You have roots, which are tap-rooted plants that could be like a dandelion, could be a carrot. They have a, a deep tap root that goes down to the subsoil and brings up minerals from below and you have vines, the climbing plants. And so the idea is to make use of all the vertical space and all the sunshine, and also to have the plants do work. So there's some plants that grow fertilizer. The black locust trees are a nitrogen fixer. So they have bacteria in their roots that take nitrogen from the air and turn it into a form, an organic nitrogen form in the soil that the plants can use. And they do that with solar energy. Um, we have beneficial attractors. So this, which you might consider a weed, um, Queen Anne's lace, the wild carrot, is attracting those beneficial wasps, which are going to eat your bad bugs. Um, so let's take a walk under the trellis here. So the adult, Danny's very much interested in education. We're trying to you show people out. that they can do this on their own. And and how you could do this on You're gonna have to scale. Duck got a little city lot, and you only have a few square feet of foundation to plant uh -huh. edibles instead of shrubs. Uh -huh. Or if you have a couple acres and you want to go whole hog. Ow! So, I know, it's just that. The grape trellis here. The grapes Ooh, are growing great. up, they're not oh, ripe cool. yet, but it's an, you can feel how delicious the shade is. That's a grape. That's pretty cool. And then we have the frog pond, so when there's water coming in, there's actually a little tiny waterfall underneath the bridge where this drops into the other pond. And then uh, normally we'd walk this way because of the stroller, we'll go back and stay on the limestone path. Okay, you need to duck. So this is designed for to be beautiful. It's designed to be useful. Nope. Although because so I hate this. Variety, we don't have a huge amount of anything. So what's available to pick is constantly changing. And it doesn't take very much for it all to be picked out. Say, oh, we want to pick strawberries. Or pick. You have strawberries to pick? Oh, well, yeah, we got three. <laughs> and they're like, damn it. Exactly. Because we're, we're not what most people expect.
It's nice and cool over here. Yeah, the shade is quite delicious. Huh? <coughs> Mulberries are not quite right. <sighs> Oh man. I know I know this much about the edible forest. I can do the 15 minute uh, lecture. We also have edible flowers. My shoes coming on tight. And Danny does business with a lot of several of the high end chefs around here. It's edible. I'm not eating it. Mom. You just take that grass. He's got a sweetness to it. Yeah, he's got no sweetness. Why don't you take the grass? You want to try some? Okay. 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 Ooh, see? It's nice. Oh my god. Hmm? Tastes like lettuce. Yeah, it's nice. Logan, come on. I'm coming. Hold on. He was um, commissioned. There's a, they have a lot of rich people around here who own their own whole island. I mean, we live on, on this island that has a bridge and interstate, which is really nice because we don't need a boat to get here. But we, there's no way we could afford to live on the water. We're in the poor part here. <laughs> but there's people who have amazing amounts of money who have oh, yeah. their own complete island. So this woman had an island, and she commissioned an artist to make this frog, and she really liked it. And then later they sold the island and left the frog, and the new people who bought it really didn't like the frog. So they <laughs> donated it to the local art museum. And Danny said, oh, that would look really good in my garden. So she made a donation, and froggy moved here. Mm -hmm. cool. yeah. Froggy 97. Yep. Ribbit. That's cool. Mm -hmm. the mouth can open. Mm -hmm. That's in the mouth. So as you can see, this part, which we call the old EF Redible Forest, has a lot of fancy machine work. Tobacco spent weeks and weeks and weeks here putting down this limestone patio and making the mounds in the pond. But Danny wanted to show that you could do the same idea uh, without all the without a big budget. So this is what we call the new EF. And it's all the same plants, but without all the expensive machine work. So basically the only machine work here is some bush hogging and rotic. We have electric fences to try and keep the deer out and it works to a certain degree. <laughs> It's about time to, to bait the electric fence. We have to put electric peanut butter sandwiches on here. <laughs> so these, these mounds here are what's called Hugel culture. It's a German term. And this, normally, this is a really dry summer here. Normally there would be six inches or a foot of standing water here. And so you couldn't really grow anything. So when we had a bunch of volunteers during COVID, they built these Hugo culture mounds and they started out and put piles of wood like logs or branches. And then they took organic matter, could be wood chips or leaves or compost and built it up and then they put a layer of dirt on top and then they planted. And what happens is over time, the wood gradually breaks down and it's like a time release fertilizer. And then also it's wicking up moisture from below to keep everything watered but it also drains and so you have deeper soil so you have more space for the roots to grow. 